Daniel chapter number 5. All right, now by way of introduction before we get started, to fill y'all in. Okay, most of us know of the king Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, he was king from Daniel chapter number 1 up until Daniel chapter number 4. Okay, Nebuchadnezzar was the one that first took the men of Israel into captivity. He took the brightest, the smartest, the most intelligent among them into his capital city so that he could have the smartest men, those that knew the most at his disposal. Well, Daniel and three other guys, Hananiah, uh, Azariah, and Mishael, took them fellas into captivity. And then we know the first three is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then Daniel was given a new name also. His new name was Belteshazzar. And Daniel first interpreted a dream for Nebuchadnezzar that troubled him sorely. And then the interpretation thereof was one from God because God was the one that troubled Nebuchadnezzar with the dream. For his service, Daniel was rewarded. He was made chief over the gate. Okay, in other words, he was made a judge of the city. Not just any city, the capital city that Nebuchadnezzar lived in. Okay, then... Nebuchadnezzar gets a bright idea to make this statue out of gold which really looked like him but he claimed was the true image of God and that everybody should bow down and worship it and then them three fellows Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego he didn't do it they said you know what we are not careful to answer the old Lord our God is able to deliver us but if not we're still not going to bow down because it's not right okay then after that he throws them in the fiery furnace now Nebuchadnezzar himself said there was a fourth man in the fire with them who looked like the son of God right Nebuchadnezzar saw Christ long before anybody else did to you know some 2,000 years ago it wasn't Christ as they would know him as Jesus but it was the angel of the Lord which is the Old Testament version of Jesus right he looked a little bit different because if he had looked like that on earth people would have been without excuse not to worship him but they were without excuse not to worship him anyway. But we can't get bogged down in that. Can't chase that rabbit. Got to move on. Okay, then we get to chapter number four of the book of Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar writes down, and he's, you know, God's given him a little bit of wisdom by this point. He writes to the every people of every nation, and he says, I want to tell y'all what God's done for me. And not talking about lowercase g. I mean, you can go back, just look at chapter number four, verse number one. Okay, it says, Nebuchadnezzar the king, unto all the people and nations and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. I thought it good to show you the signs and wonders that the high God hath wrought toward me. Okay, now you can read through there, and you can tell he doesn't, he doesn't get it all, but he gets that God allowed Daniel, allowed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to be brought into his captivity so that he could learn about God so that he could find out God wasn't that statue that he built. He called him the Most High God. He says, yeah, the, the one that we couldn't figure out on our own, the one that had to tell us about himself because he's so high. Okay, so Nebuchadnezzar may not have had all the words right, but he understood that God was God, and that he was not. Well, chapter number 5 comes along, and we get a new king, the son of Nebuchadnezzar. His name is Belshazzar. Not Belteshazzar, that was Daniel's name. Belshazzar. King of ne or son of King Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, now Belshazzar, he was a, uh, verse number one, he was a king, made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. Okay, Belshazzar, or whilst he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple, which is in Jerusalem that the king and his princes, his wives and his concubines might drink therein. Then they brought in those vessels. But what are those vessels? Those are the vessels that were sanctified unto God. Those were the vessels originally that were used in the house of God to minister, to worship, to praise God. They were reserved to be used only for God's business. But Belshazzar is using them not just to use them for earthly means but also to sin 
to drink wine with as many thousands of friends, his wives and his concubines, and he brought them forth as a token to show, guess who owns the vessels of God now? I do, because I'm the king. He's mocking God by bringing these vessels out. Then, in verse number 5, after they've defiled these, you know, uh, vessels of God, then in verse number 4 it says, they drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver and brass and iron, of wood and of stone. They're defiling what God has reserved for his use. Then, they're giving praise, honor, and glory to all the false idols. Well, verse number 5, in the same hour come forth a man or come forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace and the king saw the part of the hand that wrote well what happened well to summarize because there's a whole lot of verses between here and where we're going to get to summarize that hand the fingers wrote something on the wall that the king immediately verse number six the king's countenance was changed he wasn't happy no more he wasn't having a party whatever he saw shook him to his core he was troubled. And as a result, he calls in all the astrologers, all the magicians, all the counselors. Everybody that he knows of that can try and decipher this writing on the wall, nobody can do it. He's still troubled. They're saying, hey, we, we don't know what this means. We don't know, you know, what to tell you. Well, at one point, okay, verse number 10, Queen had a little bit of sense. Okay, the wife of Belshazzar she said now the queen by reason of the words of the king and his lords came into the banquet house and the queen spake and said, spake and said O king live forever let not thy thoughts be troubled for thee nor let thy countenance be changed there is a man in the kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods now she didn't get it that's lowercase g wasn't the spirit of God that was in Daniel it was the knowledge and the wisdom of the God the one that Nebuchadnezzar wrote about chapter before this. But again, they're still worshiping the false idols. They don't believe in God, but they know there's something special about Daniel. Okay, they call for Daniel. And then in, you know, after that, I believe it was in, uh, yeah, verse number 13, Daniel's brought in and the king says unto him, hey, we've heard about you. We've heard that you're the one that interpreted dreams for my dad when he was troubled. And then, if you can do it, if you can tell me what's written on this wall over here, we'll put you in a scarlet robe, we'll put a chain, gold chain around your neck, it won't make you the third in command of the entire kingdom. Okay, he wants to know so bad, he's willing to put somebody, you know, two steps away from his job. Not just that, somebody that was brought out of captivity. He's willing to make a slave, essentially, third most important in all the kingdom. Okay, well then, verse number 15. I'm sorry, verse number 17. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let thy gifts be to thyself, and let thy rewards to another. In other words, he's saying, I don't want your scarlet. I don't want your gold. I don't want the job. He's saying, keep it for yourself. I'm not interested in it. I've got something that's more valuable to me than that. But, he goes on to say, Yet I will read the writing unto the king and make known to him the interpretation. He said, I'm not interested in the money, not interested in the power, but I will tell you what it means. Why was he so eager to still tell the king what it was? Because he knew that that message to the king was from God. And in order to read this, God's already shown no man could have figured out what this meant. So in order to tell the interpretation thereof to the king, God had already had to show Daniel the meaning of the words on the wall before the king called for him. Right? Well, if the world's going to see that we've got something different, we're going to have to have the answer to some things that they can't figure out on their own. Where do we get them? Right here. The Word of God. How did Daniel figure it out? God showed up and told him from the Word of God. Right? Well, we go on to verse number 18. O thou king, the Most High God, the Most High God gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. Okay, then verse 19. And for the majesty that he gave him, all people, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whom he would, he slew. And whom he would, he kept alive. And whom he would, he set up. And whom he would, he put down. 
But when his heart was lifted up and his mind hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne, and they took his glory from him. And he was driven from the sons of men, and his heart was made like the beast, and his dwelling was with the wild asses. They fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till he knew that the Most High God ruled in the kingdom of men, and that he appointeth over it whomsoever he will. And thou his son, O Belshazzar, hast not humbled thine heart, though thou knew all this, but hast lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessel and they have brought the vessels of his house before thee and thou and thy lords and thy wives and thy concubines have drunk wine in them and now has praised the gods of silver and gold and of brass iron wood and stone which see not nor hear nor know and the God in whose hand thy breath is and whose are all thy ways hast thou not glorified then was the part of the hand sent from him and this writing was written and this is the writing that was written, Mene, Mene, Tekel, uh, a farsim. This is the interpretation thereof. Mene, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tekel, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Paris, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Okay, then after this you find that Belshazzar, even though Daniel said he wasn't interested in it, at least he was a man of his word. He gave Daniel a scarlet robe, put a gold chain around his neck, made him third in command. Okay, then, in the night, verse number 30, Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, was slain. And Darius, the Median, took the kingdom, being about three score and two years old. What happened? What God said was going to happen happened that very night. But it is the writing on the wall, which is where that term comes from, by the way, that we're going to be taking a look at in the interpretation that Daniel gave unto the king. Okay, verse number 25. And this is the writing that was written, Mene, Mene. What was that? Well, verse number 26. And this is the interpretation of the thing. Mene. God has numbered thy kingdom and finished it. God knows everything about your kingdom, Belshazzar. God knows not just everything about it. He's numbered it. He knows everything in it, everything around it. And he knows such about every other kingdom. How else would God know that the Medes and the Persians would divide up his kingdom? And he says, I know more than just about you. I know everything. Now see, Belshazzar, we can go back. Okay, verse number 22. And thou his son, talking about Nebuchadnezzar's son, O Belshazzar, hast not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest all this. Belshazzar knew that Nebuchadnezzar, when he got too big for his britches, God humbled him. God brought him low until he realized that God was the one that owned everything. And God was the one who raised men up into positions of powers, who gave those the ability to do what they do. In fact, Daniel said, you don't even realize that you didn't give praise to the one who holds the very breath, your very breath in his hand. He says, you've known all this, but yet you still defied God. He said, you saw, you heard, you've been taught, and yet you still took the thing that you should have considered holy, and you've defiled it with wine, and you've worshipped false gods. He says, you've forgotten that Mene, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. God's the one that set everything into place, not you. They're having a big celebration here. They're having a feast. A thousand people show up to have a good time. They're talking about how good a job they've done running the country. They're talking about how great they are because of the great country that they have. Or the great kingdom that they are in charge of. But yet God's the one that finished it. They wouldn't have been able to do it. They wouldn't have been able to take another day and do what they wanted unless it was the will of God. They forgot that it's not man that does anything. It is God that allows man to do things that fit into his plan. Even those that do wickedly, if God can get glory and honor out of the end of it, he'll permit it to happen. Sometimes he allows people to do wickedly so that the people of God will do what they were supposed to do all along. Look at the early church. They were supposed to go into Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. But... 
They didn't. They'd stayed at Jerusalem, which is why persecution came to the church at Jerusalem to scatter the church so that they would finally do what God told them to do, which was to spread the gospel. Now certainly there were some, like the Apostle Paul. He went into Asia Minor, but what about all the countries right around Israel? All the other ones that were there on the you know, coast of the, the Red Sea, you, you know, you've got the Sea of Galilee right there. Well, who was going to Samaria? Who was going to Judea? Who was going to all the places that the Apostle Paul went past on his missionary journeys? Very few, which is why God sent persecution. And you study it out, through the persecution, the church only got stronger, not weaker. So God can take men that desire to do wicked things and still use it for his honor and his glory. See, Belshazzar had forgotten that. And then the third word, Paris, the kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. In other words, he's saying, you're getting ready to have everything that you're so proud of, that you're glorifying in, that you're so happy to have this banquet and this feast over, it's about ready to be split in two and given to two other people the Medes and the Persians who is Darius down in verse number 31 the Median one of the Medes he's saying you're so glad with what God gave you and you're not willing to give them the credit for giving it to you God's going to take it away just to show you that he's got power over he's not just going to take it away he's going to break it he's going to split it in two part's going to go to the Medes part's going to go to the Persians what was that? That's just, you know, verse number one, that's God's omnipotence, or I mean God's omniscience, the first word that we talked about, mene. God's numbered it and he knows it. Well, that finished part in this split here and giving it away, that's God's omnipotence. All power. Just to prove to everybody else in this kingdom that God is God. He's going to split it, give it to two other people, show that you didn't have the power. But what is that tekel? Thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. See, he knew. He was taught. He understood who God was. He just didn't choose to accept God as God was. He wanted to be bigger than God. He wanted to be able to control the gods of gold and silver and wood, brass. Why do you think people create their own God so that they can dictate what those gods will do for them and what they have to do for those gods why do people rebel against God because they've got one they got a real big problem with one word Lord they don't want to submit they don't want to humble themselves God humbled Nebuchadnezzar because God or because Nebuchadnezzar wouldn't humble himself before God then after the light bulb came on in Nebuchadnezzar's mind and he realized when he was out there eating grass, when he was sleeping out in fields with donkeys and all other kind of livestock, and God allowed his senses to come back to him, and he said, you know what? I think, you know, that God might really be God. That's why we have chapter number four, to let everybody know, God's done a lot of stuff for me, even though I didn't deserve it. He said, I'm going to tell you all about the signs and the wonders and the works that God's done for me. He says he's used a couple of old Jew boys over here to show me a lot of it. See, Belshazzar, he'd read chapter number four, even though it may not have been chapter number four. It may have been a letter back then. He read that. Might have been there when his dad wrote it. He heard about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He heard about Daniel, but he had forgotten them. That's why his wife had to remind him who Daniel was. Daniel was the one that was given the job of being in charge of all the jokers, that Belshazzar asked to see first. He should have called for Daniel because Daniel was in charge of all of them. But he didn't. He went around them. He said, bring me all the underlings. He'd forgotten that Daniel had been in place in charge of all the, as they called them, magicians and astrologers. He didn't want to hear what God had to say on it. He was calling all of the soothsayers, all the ones that worshipped the stars, all the ones that we talked about when we did that demonology bit he's calling all them jokers in he wants to hear what everybody else has to say except God 
So when God wrote tackle on the wall, he's saying, you knew, and this is what was expected of you, and you found wanting. When we weigh out what you've actually done as opposed to what you know, you're missing a whole lot. And see, Nebuchadnezzar, he was prideful. He's big in his own eyes, but God knew that he could humble him. Why did God turn Belshazzar over to be destroyed? It was slain that night, that very day. Why did God do the same to him? Because Belshazzar had been given every opportunity to humble himself, and God knew that if he didn't humble himself, he wouldn't be humble. There are some that know. They've been taught. They've heard. And it doesn't have an impact on them. Belshazzar wasn't a young man. Nebuchadnezzar ruled for a while. And when he took the throne, he had heard time and time again. They just didn't care. So God wrote Tekel. Thou art weighed in the balances and art found one. All right, so with the Lord's help this morning, we're going to teach on being found wanting. Being found one. Okay. Every opportunity Belshazzar had. Every opportunity. How much more opportunity have we had? Have we heard? Have we seen in this very church? God has given us every opportunity to get all in. Not just, you know, tiptoeing into the water, all in. Because where much is given, much is required. Much was required of Belshazzar because he was given the kingship of, at that point, one of the greatest countries even throughout history. You, even the secular world will admit that there was a guy named Nebuchadnezzar and he had a great kingdom. They won't admit that God gave him that kingdom and that God took that kingdom away from his son and split it. Well, who were the Persians? Persians had one of the greatest empires in all of history. Part of what they started with was taken away from this fellow. Right? Great kingdom. Been given everything and God expected something from him. See, God had let his people be taken into captivity by this nation so that his people would return to worshiping God because they had forgotten about God. You want to know why Daniel was given a scarlet robe and a gold chain? One, because he did what God wanted him to do. And because God still wasn't done with Daniel turn a couple of pages he's right underneath of the king there's 120 princes there's three presidents over those princes that report to the king guess who's in charge of those three Daniel he moved from third in the country to second in the country overnight almost but why did they hate Daniel why did they try and get him thrown in the lines then because he did what God told him to do and that's all that he wanted to do he would do what the king asked him to do because God gave him the position, but he just wanted to do what God wanted him to do. That's why he prayed so often. That's why when he came in, he said, I don't want what you want, or what you want to give me. I want what God wants for me. Daniel, through all this hardness, what did he do? He still just worshiped God. The people of Israel, those that didn't want to worship God, they were destroyed long before the captivity ever started. When the nation of Nebuchadnezzar invaded, they were destroyed because God knew they're hard-hearted and stiff-necked. They're not going to repent. But those that were willing to, you know what, long before captivity happened, Daniel was faithful. Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, they were faithful. In fact, they were so faithful that when they were taken into captivity, the king's emissary you know, the chief of the eunuchs, tried to get them to eat all manner of meat and everything else to strengthen them up, and they said, we can't eat that, because God said we can't eat that. So, you know what we're going to eat instead? We're going to eat, like, vegetable soup for however long this period lasted. And he said, I can't let y'all do that. If you guys show up emaciated and look like you're starving, the king's going to kill me. They said, hey, give us a trial period. And if it don't look good after the first trial period, then we'll do the other thing. Well, after that trial period, guess what happened? They looked stronger and healthier than the ones that had been eating all the meat and everything else. Why? Because they didn't do it for their glory, but for God's. Amen. We've had them same lessons. Some of you have had hardship to prove that 
the proof's in the pudding in your life. But see, when God looks at us, he doesn't view well, what we've done. He doesn't see why we do it. He weighs what we were expected to do versus what we've done. Man looks at it from, well, I, I did this for God, but why did you do it for God? Did you do it for the scarlet and for the gold and for the position? Did you do it for the notoriety of man? Or did you do it like Daniel for the honor and glory of God? Those are the things that God weighs. Why does God weigh that? Because where a man's heart is, or where a man's treasure is, that's where his heart is also. If you're doing it for the scarlet and for the gold and for the position, that's where your heart is. But Daniel said, no, nah, I'm going to tell you what it means because God wrote it on the wall and God told me to tell you what it says. Daniel wasn't at the party, but yet you can go back and read what we just read. He told him everything that they had done that night, all the different gods that they had worshipped, and he wasn't even in the room. How did he do that? God told him beforehand. Everything that God calls you to do, he will equip you to do it. But we have to be willing to say, this is what God expects, and this is what I will do. Because anything less, we're found wanting. How many people out in Florence, Kentucky today were we supposed to have reached already? But because it was inconvenient. But, or because we were too prideful to humble ourselves and say, I'll admit that I was wrong to that person so I can go over there and witness to them. Lord, I won't tell them they did me wrong before. Lord, I won't tell them you don't know what they've said about me. Lord, I won't get that made right. Know what we're doing? We're holding feasts and showing how great we are and doing what we want rather than what God wants. One day he'll say, you were wanting. Now see, those that aren't wanting, God's got great things in store for them. You guys know it? I mean, we already mentioned after Daniel interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's dream, he made him chief of the gate. You know what Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah got after they... You know, defied the king one, which was an offense that was punishable by death, which he tried to kill him, but God wouldn't let him kill him. In fact, the fire was so hot, it killed the guards that threw him into the fire, but they didn't even smell like smoke when they came out. Right? Nebuchadnezzar saw that, and he said, not because they're great, but because of the fourth man in the fire, I'm going to give them fellows some positions. You want to know why God blessed Nebuchadnezzar? Because Nebuchadnezzar was willing to admit that he was wrong. You can go back and read everything that Daniel said about Nebuchadnezzar, his father. He said, you know what? He was prideful. He was so prideful, he built a statue that looked like himself and claimed that it was God. That's pretty prideful. If I put a photo of me up on the board and said, hey, I think that this is what God looks like, you'd all be right to shoot me. If God didn't strike me down with lightning right then and there, cause me to die of an aneurysm or something. Right? Oh, by the way, the guy who painted that painting of Jesus that most people hang in their houses, it was really a self-portrait. That, that ought to help some people. That's why he had blue eyes and blonde hair. Okay. But we, we can get prideful. But see, God blessed Nebuchadnezzar because although he was prideful, he was willing to step back and say, I think I was wrong there. See, every now and then, this flesh is going to rear up. Right? You're going to be at enmity with yourself. You're going to be in conflict with yourself, and your flesh is going to want to say, well, I don't have to do that. Well, the key is to set, step back and be able to say, you know what? That's wrong. I don't think that's right. A few times this week, I won't get into the details, but hey, month and a half on my new job, looks like we're going to be in a long, drawn-out litigation. Yay. Just what I wanted. A month and a half in. And about Monday, I wanted to go and strangle somebody because I was so angry and frustrated and stressed. Got hardly any sleep this week because I've been up and saying, Lord, how in the world am I going to do this? How are we going to sort this thing out? We're not in the wrong here. But we got to get back what's due to us. And then about Thursday, God smacked me upside the back of the head and said, 
why are you worrying about it? I've got it all in control. And I was like, yep, yep, that's right. I was worried all week about what am I, how am I going to fix this? Because am I, that's why they hired me, to fix things like this. And I'd tried it, I'd done it all right, Brother Mike. I'd done it. I'd been long-suffering, and I'd been patient. I didn't go and strangle somebody on Monday. I wanted to, but I didn't. Been long-suffering, been patient. Had done everything the right way. And then in my mind, okay, I've given them three days. It's time to go scorched earth policy. And then about Thursday, God said, well, did I go scorched earth policy the first time you heard the gospel and didn't accept it? You're right, Lord. Thursday, Miss Sheila's been taking up gifts at the chiropractic office. If somebody brings in a gift, they get a free treatment. Well, what's that gift going to? It's going to them kids down in St. Lucia for Christmas presents. And I'm sitting there, I made a poster with some pictures of those kids that are from the ghetto areas of St. Lucia. And God's saying, really, is life all that bad? He says, you know where you're sleeping tonight. You know where your food's coming from. You know where lunch is, it was just about lunchtime. He says, you don't have to worry about where your lunch is coming from. You don't have to worry about where you're going to sleep. Don't have to worry about what you're going to wear, not just today, but tomorrow, and let's be honest, the next couple of weeks. You don't have to worry about if the next person that you meet is going to try and take advantage of you. You're right, Lord. The fact that this is the biggest problem in my life is the great sign of a blessing. If that's the worst that I've got to deal with right now, God's been good to me. People got it a lot worse. And what's the worst that can happen? If I do die of a stroke due to all this stress, I'm in heaven. Hallelujah. Right, well, what was that? That was God doing the work on me, sending me out to a field like he did Nebuchadnezzar, and saying, hey, this is where you could be, but you're not. Well, Monday through about half a Thursday, I was found wanting. Not just about what we do, it's why we do it, how we do it, and with what intent we do it with. You can go out and do the right thing with hate in your heart. God's not going to bless it. You're found wanting. Yeah, you're right. You can go out and do the right thing, but all the while hoping that God doesn't help the person that you're telling about. Go see Jonah. He got angry when the nation of Nineveh repented, and God didn't destroy them all. Yeah. He was found wanting. God did a work on him. And that wasn't the first time he was found wanting. Remember, he spent three days in a fish humbling up for a while. But how many times are we found wanting? We know it all. We've heard it all. We understand. He had access to the things of God. Because of all those vessels, he could have worshipped God like the Jews used to worship God in Jerusalem. He could have set up a temple for God in the capital of their nation. And had all those Jew boys that he brought out of captivity ministers as Levites in the temple of God and could have worshipped God. But instead, he used them for filthy lucre. Used them for his own ends. And God just wrote on the wall one day. Four words. Short, sweet, and to the point. But the second word was, this isn't because I'm angry at you. It's not because God hates you. It's not because God doesn't love you anymore. It's because God knows you've been found wanting. Because if you're found wanting, it means you're of no use to God. I mean, I talked last, or preached last night over at the work camp on what's your prerogative. Why do you do what you do for God? Do you do it so that when you lay your head down on your pillow at night, you can say, well, I went to church today. Well, that, is that all that the Bible tells us to do? Get saved, go to church once a week? Do you do it so that you get a pat on the back? Do you do it because you want the preeminence among men like diatrophies? Because you want people to notice you? All of those things you're found wanting. Why are we found wanting? Because it's all about me. Or it's all about somebody else. Anybody ever do something just to spite somebody else? I know I'm not the only one that's done that. 
Y'all understand that in my, it is, it's in my flesh, I like to burn bridges. You do me wrong, all right, we're done. Cut off. No more. Nip it in the bud, as Barney Fife would say. All right, see you. Have a good life. But I'm glad God didn't do us like that. Amen. What are the fruit of the Spirit? Well, we like to talk about love and joy and peace. What about long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, temperance? Still working on that one, and patience. Okay, I like to run hot, and it's not that hard to get me up to six gear and to just rev the engine. Right, but the problem is God can't use somebody that's always in six gear. You're going to burn the pistons out of the engine. And if that car is running along next to another one, watch one of them NASCAR races where an engine goes. All the cars behind it get taken out too. God's not in the business of damaging one of his children and causing more damage to those that are running behind him. What was the commandment for God's children? To be fruitful. Amen. To bear much fruit. Now what's much fruit for you may be different for me, but God knows what's expected of you. And one of these days we're all going to stand before him and we're going to have the fruit that our life brought for God weighed against what God expected from us. And the question is, will we be found wanting? What is much fruit? Much fruit is you take that seed that he put in you, called himself, and you allow the fruits of the Spirit to grow. It's not about the fruit that you become. It's the fruit that you go out and reap for him. Some plant, some water, God gives the increase. But God does need workers to go out into the field. Jesus said, look in the fields, they're white already to harvest. He says, I need laborers to go out and to get it. God doesn't expect us to become this great tree that has a whole bunch of fruit on it. Although he does say that if you are a Christian, you'll have Christian fruit. You'll know a tree by the fruit that it bears. But when he says bear much fruit, he's not talking about me. He's talking about the fruit that I can go out there and get for him. To be obedient to go. Daniel, because of his actions, because of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, because of those four boys alone, the king of a great nation was humbled and God did a work on him until he realized those boys know the real God. What was their fruit? Well, during that period, people were allowed to worship God freely in a nation that wasn't their own. In fact, God put those boys in control so even though the king may not have always done right, those boys in the eyes of God did. Well, what's that mean? That means that the people on down the pipeline in the entire country, they were getting to hear what God said on the issue. Not what man said on the issue. They were getting to see how God would do things rather than how man would do things. That's why God gave them the positions because he knew that he, they would honor God with those positions. They bore much fruit. Not just in their personal life, but also outwardly. They laid up treasure in heaven. Gold, silver, and precious gems. Not the things that will corrupt down here. But well... What's the alternative? Well, I can bear as much fruit as I want. But one tree that has a whole lot of fruit really doesn't do all that good. Really doesn't. Where does all that fruit fall? Right underneath of that tree. Where do the seeds end up? Right underneath of that tree. And if that tree's that big and that strong and it's producing that much fruit, there's not enough nutrients in the ground to support all the seeds. The tree's going to starve them out. That's why God told us to go. Now see, we may be under adversity. King, looking at Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, looking at Daniel, you wouldn't think there was anything special about him. Some of us may be a little withered. We may be growing sideways sometimes because of all the wind. Right? We may not have any leaves because they've all been plucked off by all the conditions that we've been under. But when we still bear fruit, the world will say, there's something different about that tree. Everything says that that tree shouldn't have any fruit. But it's still got fruit. Why has it got fruit? Because you just wanted to be what God wanted you to be. God's grace is that no matter where we are, He can still use us to do whatever He wants us to, to do for Him. We're found wanting when we say, well, I want to go over there and grow on that hill. There's no problems over there. 
But when we submit and say, there may be problems right there, but I'm going to bear fruit where I'm planting. I remember Buster Kinsey preached that message. Just bloom where you're planting. Wherever God puts you, produce fruit. Wherever you are, give out some of that fruit of the Spirit that God gave to you so that God can make some trees out of other people. And really, bear much fruit. We, I mean, we've heard our pastor talk about it. Jeremiah, some 40 years, zero converts. God still knew that he bore much fruit. But it's not about in how much I produce. Not about how much comes as a result of it. Although God says that his word will never return void. Everything that Jeremiah preached, we could still get help from today because God had Jeremiah record it. Had it pinned down so that generations to come could hear what Jeremiah preached because the people in his day didn't appreciate it. Right? Jeremiah's still reaping fruit to God's account to this day every time somebody turns to that book. You just do what God tells you to do. It may not be worth it in the world's eyes or even in your own eyes. But God may come and smack you upside the back of the head and say, hey, I'm taking care of you. Why are you worried about what other people think? Why are you worried about what they might say if you go and do this? You're going to be like a tree planted by the waters. No matter what comes at you, I'll keep you where you're supposed to be. Just bear much fruit. They may take a bite and spit it back at you, but keep bearing fruit. Daniel had every reason other than the fact that he realized how good God had been to him. He was a slave in a foreign country where the king basically pretended he didn't exist because he should have called him first said all them other jokers. He could have been back in his you know, chamber saying, Lord, why have you forgotten about me? How come the king hadn't come and got me? But instead, he's just still talking to God. If he wasn't right with God, God wouldn't have given him the answer to the message that God wrote on the wall. Why? Because Daniel knew no matter where I go, long before he ended up in the lines then, he knew no matter where I go, no matter what I'm facing, God's God and I'm going to serve him. Daniel wasn't found wanting. Every day we should ask God, Lord, weigh me, measure me. Put me on the scale and Lord, show me where I didn't live up to your expectations yesterday so that today I won't be found wanting. Lord, junk me and myself and fill me with you because I don't want to be found wanting. Because one day we may stand before his throne and hear the word tekel. And we'll turn around and we'll see all those that we could have reached. We'll see all those that could have been saved if we would have been obedient to pray more. Or when a missionary came to give more. But instead of, you know, listening, hearken, and instead of applying and doing, we stubbed up on God and got prideful. Said, nope. And used the very things that God gives to us. Those vessels that were meant to honor God, and we use the things that God's given us, our talents, our ability, our attention, our time, and instead of using them for God, we use them for selfish endeavors. We're just like Belshazzar. We're just like all the heathen nations throughout the Bible and the rest of the world that scoff at the blessings of God. Forgetting that he holds every action, every breath of our entire life in his hand. That he's already numbered, the, numbered our lives and he's finished it. God knows how everything's going to finish out and it's by his power that we keep going. That we're going to have the life that God desired for us to have. We forget he is the I am. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is Jehovah. And when we forget that, it's real easy to forget. The only reason I'm still breathing is because he allows it. I don't want to be found wanting. I want to be one of them that he says, well done, now good and faithful servant. I want to be one of them that even the world recognizes and says there's something different about him. And they did what came natural to them. They tried to glorify Daniel, hoping that it would appease God. But that didn't change the fact that they were found wanting. And at that point, it was too late to go back and change all them things. He could have worshipped God all he wanted to. At that point, he would have been found wanting. Because everything up to that point, his actions spoke louder than the words. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? 
If so, head on over to ibcforums.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.